now. It'll go live in a couple seconds, and then I'll finish sharing. I apologize for that. That's okay. I apologize, everyone. Um, of course, we've already run into a little bit of a technical glitch, but we're going to go ahead and get things running again now. And I will share the screen for Julie, so everyone should be able to now see it. And I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. Okay, Take thank you. All right. Hihani washte Julie Thorsen sena machiapi. Oksapi ki gluhamani wen lakota machiapi. Me lakota. Wak pa washte in taha. Iokpia wa chiyanke. In tancha Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. Good morning. My name is Julie Thorstensen. My Lakota name is She Carries Her Wisdom With Her. I am Lakota and a citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux Nation in North Central South Dakota. I'm really happy to see you, even if it's virtually. And as Butch mentioned, I am the Executive Director of the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. I want to thank the National Wildlife Federation for this opportunity to speak to you today and acknowledge that I am still a student myself as I journey through life. I'm going to tell you about my journey to my dream job and hope you will find something useful in my story that will help you as you start your own careers. Next slide, please. Before I get started on my story of my career path, I think it's important to acknowledge those who came before us and sacrificed so that we may have opportunities. This is a picture of my maternal great-great-great-grandmother. My Lakota comes from my maternal side, and we have a common history as many Native people with marrying non-Natives and children going to boarding school. This history resulted in my family's loss and distancing from our culture and language. I am now learning them as an adult. I think it was in college that I began to experience doubt in who I was. This is where I started getting questions like, you're native? You don't look native. In my native community, I would more likely be asked, who's your family, than how much blood are you? The government only quantifies three things by blood quantum, dogs, horses, and Native Americans. Next slide, please. I also want to make sure that you have a basic understanding of some of the common terms I will use throughout my talk today. And I apologize to those who already know these. My intention is not to patronize anyone. Indian country is defined as all land within the limits of any Indian reservation under the jurisdiction of the United States government. A federally recognized tribe is an American Indian or Alaska Native tribal entity that is recognized as having a government to government relationship with the United States, with the responsibilities, powers, limitations, and obligations attached to that designation, and is eligible for funding and services from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, reservation, Indian Reservation is a legal designation for an area of land managed by a federally recognized Native American tribe under the United States Bureau of Indian Affairs. It's not by the state government of the United States in which they are physically, physically located. Uh, are we having problems seeing? I'm sorry, but I see a chat question. Uh, this is a very limited introduction to common terminology working with tribes. So please, if you hear something or see something you're not familiar with, feel free to ask me at the end of my presentation. Next slide, please. Mitake Onasi is a common Lakota phrase that means all my relations. We believe we are related or connected to everything, which is common in, among indigenous people. However, tribes are not identical. There are 574 unique federally recognized tribes in the United States. We look different, we talk different, we don't all have casinos and per capita payments. We are on the plains, the tundra, the oceans, the Everglades, forests, the deserts, lakes, and the cities. We have different land bases and we each have our own history. Next slide, please. Tribes own our influence and management of nearly 140 million acres including more than 730,000 acres of lakes and reservoirs, 10,000 miles of streams and rivers, and 18 million acres of forests. These lands and waters provide habitat for fish and wildlife, including more than 500 species listed as threatened or endangered. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now on to my story. I grew up on my homelands near the Morrow River with my four siblings. We are almost like two families as the three older siblings which includes me 
uh, and the two younger siblings have a 15 year span from my oldest brother to my youngest sister. I spent a lot of time on the back of a horse helping my family on our cow-calf ranching operation. It was hours spent fishing, playing in the river, and being and working outside in an environment that led me to choose a career in natural resources. Next slide. Family has always been the most important thing in my life. I grew up working alongside my family as we ranched. I have one older brother and three younger sisters. We were the ranch hands growing up. My parents didn't define work by gender. There was no women's work or men's work. There was just work to be done. I can drive a tractor or ride a horse just as well as I can cook a meal for a crew. My childhood and my family influenced who I am now and even my career choices. As we would ride the pastures, my dad would point out different things, such as sharp-tailed grouse, dance grounds, or different types of grasses. We fished and picked wild berries. And it's these experiences that started me on a natural resource career path. Next, please. After all, my dancing career was going nowhere. I went to high school in a primarily white community. My family identified as Native American, and that's how I was raised. Not necessarily traditional Lakota, but with a respect for my culture and a pride in it. Growing up, my parents never asked if I was going to college. I was always asked where I was going to college. Education was strongly encouraged in my family. My father was raised by a young single mother and wanted his four daughters to be educated and independent. I was also very fortunate to have teachers that recognized my potential and helped me gain confidence in myself. I graduated valedictorian in my class, which helped me with scholarships. I went to South Dakota State University and obtained my bachelor's of science degree in biological sciences with a zoology emphasis in animal science and chemistry minors. Next, please. While at South Dakota State University, I was on the collegiate rodeo team for four years. My family has been involved in rodeo for several generations, and college rodeo helped keep me centered by having my horse with me at school to ride and care for, and also helped me with scholarship money. Being a first generation college student and the second of five kids, I relied heavily on academic scholarships and federal loans. In the summer, I worked construction and labor jobs to pay for my school. My parents' lack of gender Specific defined work played a role in my summer jobs as well. At the end of my sophomore year of college, a local rock quarry that supplied our rodeo with sand asked if anyone was looking for a summer job. I was the only one to raise my hand, and surprisingly, they hired me. I spent the entire summer shoveling. I worked long hours and gained big muscles, and it paid for my living expenses and some of my tuition for the following year. Next, please. The summer after I graduated with my bachelor's, I married my husband, Justin, and became a stepmom to twin daughters. I now had a degree, a husband, a family, but I struggled to find a job. We were living off reservation, and my brother was working back home for the tribe and encouraged me to apply for a job back home. Next, please. <clears throat> I was fortunate to begin my career as a wildlife habitat biologist for my tribe, the Shiner Sioux Tribes Game Fish and Parks Department. I was 22 years old, fresh out of college, supervising 50 plus year old men who had been there for a long time. They challenged me daily, asking me random science questions like, what's the gestation period of a field mouse? But I'm glad they did this because this helped me learn the importance of what they had to offer science. They had experience and traditional ecological knowledge. And I love that job. I learned so much at this job. Because tribal fish and game programs are typically underfunded and understaffed, working for the tribe gave me the most diverse career opportunities. I worked with endangered species, such as the black-footed ferret, conducted trapping for wild turkey relocation, worked with large mammals, such as deer, elk, and buffalo, darting and microchipping them. I did tons of surveys, such as shoreline surveying for interior lease turns and piping clovers, and several upland game birds. I also learned administration duties such as supervising, account management, reporting, and became a successful grant writer and manager. We even started a res dog show for our local youth. I learned that I would need to communicate in different manners depending on my surroundings as well. When I met with tribal council, I said buffalo. When I met with US Fish and Wildlife Service, I said bison. I also started to see how differently people treated and acted. My sister and I were both biologists for our tribe and attended national conference in the early 2000s. We noticed how people changed their interaction with us once they found out we worked for a tribe. 
I felt like I spent most of my time validating that I was a real biologist. It was disheartening, especially since in reality, we were probably doing more work with less resources than our state and federal counterparts. I'm happy to report my experience at a more recent conference was much more inviting. Next, please. <clears throat> Life was busy during my seven and a half years as a wildlife biologist for the tribe. We added a daughter to our family in 2000. We bought a home, all the major life steps in a nice Western linear fashion. Next, please. It was also during my time with the tribe that I completed my master's of science degree in biological sciences. I was extremely fortunate to be part of a Kellogg Foundation funded master's and doctorate cohort program called the Prairie PhD. My research used GIS for a native cottonwood riparian selection, habitat site selection on the Shiner Sioux Reservation. And I walked the stage for graduation eight months pregnant with my second child and our, our first son, which by the way, that is not the most flattering picture of me. Next, please. <clears throat> Next slide, thank you. You might be thinking I was already at my dream job working as a wildlife habitat biologist for my tribe, but the road is not always straight, easy or without risk. My sister and I had worked together for six years and she got married and moved and I decided I needed a new challenge. So this next part of my journey, I like to call the detour. Next, please. I worked for Presentation College, a small private healthcare college at the camp as the campus administrator at their satellite campus on the Shiner Sioux Reservation for five years. This was a complete change from my work as a biologist. I traded my ball caps and jeans for slacks and suits. It was here I learned the most about working to serve a mission. I had also decided after I earned my master's that public speaking was my weakness and that I needed to improve on this. I began serving as an adjunct professor for the local tribal college and then for presentation college, teaching environmental and general science courses. I also earned my doctorate during this time. Next, please. I was two months pregnant with my third child when my advisor called and said she had received funding for my doctorate work. Having a new newborn motivated me to finish. I was extremely fortunate to get to travel to Bolivia, which of these pictures are from, some of these pictures are from. As part of my research, my dissertation was on incorporating culture into ethics education for scientists and engineers. I worked with public and private universities and colleges, tribal colleges, and an international college in Bolivia. I completed my doctorate of philosophy in biological sciences from South Dakota State University in 2012. And then I got restless and wanted to get into science, back into science more. Next, please. So I moved to the healthcare field at our local hospital, first as an infection control coordinator with the Indian Health Service, and then as our tribe's health CEO, and then back to Indian Health Service as a clinical services administrator. I learned a lot, of, I learned about working with federal contracts, the federal government system, and advocated for tribal funding. I spent a lot of time researching and traveling but my time in healthcare taught me four things. One, I could learn anything. Two, I was not happy working in healthcare. And three, three, I wanted to work for tribes. And then number four, next slide, please. No matter how much money a job pays, it's not worth it if it causes you stress and unhappiness. After my six years in healthcare, I left and started my own consulting business, focusing mainly on organizational structure and research. Next, please. This was a time of self-reflection. I had started on a clear straight line path and veered off. What did I really want to do? What would make me happy career-wise? I was really missing working in wildlife and working on the tribal side. I had all the degrees and this really messy looking career path. I started looking for ways to use everything I had learned in my education as well as in my jobs for that one perfect position. Next, please. I was fortunate to find a job in wildlife working for tribes that I could use my education and all of the skills I had accumulated along my career journey. In May of 2019, I started my position with the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society, a nonprofit organization founded in 1983 with the mission to assist Native American and Alaska Native tribes with conservation, protection, and enhancement of their fish and wildlife resources. I had been an active member of NAFWS and even sat on the board of directors as a Great Plains Regional Director during my time as a wildlife habitat biologist for my tribe. I was drawn to the mission and helping tribes in a field that I loved. Next, please. The NAFWS purposes include charitable, scientific, education, and cultural services. We provide mechanisms for information and publication networking, 
conferencing, training symposiums, instructive professional and youth practicums, technical services, and administrative council support. Next, please. The NAFWS has 227 support member tribes, meaning 227 individual tribes have expressed their support of the work we do through a tribal resolution. We take this very seriously and want to make sure we represent each of our member tribes respectfully and individually. I find that in an increasing effort to include tribes, there's still a misunderstanding of the diversity within Indian Country. There are four, 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States as of 2021. As I mentioned at the start of my presentation, I am constantly learning. I try to learn as much as I can about each of the tribes, and I'm reminded daily how diverse and rich in knowledge Indigenous people are. We also have individual memberships, and most of our members are Native people who work in fish and wildlife or natural resources in Indian Country. Our members include conservation law enforcement officers, biologists, wildlife and fisheries technicians, program administrators, and they come from the tribal, federal, the state, non-governmental organization, private, and academics. So basically anyone who shares our mission is welcome to become a member of the society. Next, please. We have several programs that we offer, including our summer youth practicum for Native American, Alaska Native incoming 12th and 10th to 12th graders, conservation law enforcement officer training, we offer technical assistance, such as grant review or species-specific help, promotion of tribal programs. We offer scholarships. New this year, we have four summer internships, our newsletter from the Eagle's Nest, and we also have conferences and workshops. Next, please. National Native organizations like NAFWS are important. We serve our membership to ensure tribes are included, acknowledged, and understood. And I love my job. I love learning about tribes and helping others understand the challenges that tribal fish and wildlife managers face and also the many successes that they have. Next, please. <clears throat> I am also fortunate to work with an extremely talented group. This is the NAFWS staff, and you can see I'm the tall Plains Indian on the left. I want to give them a shout out. Karen Lynch, Public Information Officer, Ashley Carlisle, Education Coordinator, both are Danae. Heidi McCain, our Office Manager, Membership Coordinator, and Yavapai Apache. Corey Lucero, Fish and Wildlife Biologist, Sac and Fox Nation. Sean Cross, Fish and Wildlife Biologist from the Flathead Indian Reservation. And not pictured is Robert Romero, our Contract Conservation Law Enforcement Officer Coordinator from the Pueblo of Laguna Citizen. Next, please. So as you think about your career and where you want to be, don't overlook the opportunities working for tribes. There's such a need in Indian country. And as you can see from my story, I never left home. And I was able to work in several different professions, wildlife, academics, healthcare. I work for tribal, private, federal, myself, and now the nonprofit sector. My wildlife experience alone is enviable to many. I was not confined to one specialty and was more of a generalist. The one thing about my eclectic career journey is I have no regrets. Every step contributed to who I am today and what I'm capable of doing. Next, please. There are many opportunities in Indian country for students, such as the NAFWS Summer Youth Practicum for incoming 12th to 10th to 12th grade Native American Alaska Native students. We have four paid summer internships this year focusing on general tribal fish and wildlife management, education and conservation law enforcement and fisheries. The Wildlife Society has a Native Peoples Working Group, and we would be happy to help you find opportunities like these. As you move forward to your career, there are many ways you can work to benefit tribes. You can work directly for a tribe. Many states have tribal liaison positions, as well as numerous, numerous federal agencies. Academics, such as tribal colleges or land-grant universities, you can serve as a private contractor, are with one of the nonprofits that work with tribes. These career opportunities may not be as visible as others, but they are out there and they are needed. Next, please. And what will you do if you work in Indian country? The real question is what won't you do? You will work with threatened and endangered species, such as the Mexican wolf, the White Mountain Apache tribe in Arizona help reintroduce, are the Eastern Hellbender and the Carolina, North, Carolina Northern Flying Squirrel, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in North Carolina work with, Maybe you help a species recover, such as the endangered black-footed ferret that many Great Plains tribes help with, or be part of a larger restoration project 
for species like the salmon and buffalo. Next, please. Maybe you'll work with new innovative projects tribes have done and continue to do, such as the Confederated, Sal Confederate Salish Kootenai Tribe of Montana and their 43 wildlife underpass crossing structures. And this one pictured on the left named the Animals Bridge. Or help salmon across dams on the Columbia River with the salmon cannon the Colville Confederate and other Northwest tribes are using. Or maybe you'll assist in climate change and adaptability work like the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission has done and incorporate traditional ecological knowledge. Next, please. Or you can work with wildlife disease and invasive species almost everywhere, but maybe you'll help tribes collect data on chronic wasting disease or help the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians with their feral hog removal efforts. Whatever it is you do, I hope you consider this. Next, please. <clears throat> Take time to smell the roses. I look back at what all I had the opportunity to do in my life and my career, and now when I'm in the moment of some of those really cool things, I pause and enjoy it. Find what makes you happy. Life is just too short not to be happy. And find what you're good at and do it. And find what you're not good at and don't do it. This was advice one of my mentors gave me, and it saved me a lot of headache trying to become an IT specialist. Now I just call someone who is. Next, please. Say yes to opportunities. Things may not, may not always seem right on your journey. The timing might not seem right on your journey, but it probably is. And don't be afraid of the detours. My dad panicked the first time I switched jobs. But having taken all of the detours, I know exactly what I want to do, and I'm no longer wondering if there's something better out there for me. And you don't have to have it all figured out. When I graduated high school, I told my parents I was going to be an agricultural engineer and never move home. I could not have ever predicted all of the turns and twists that have taken place since that bold statement. Next, please. For me, I stated in the beginning of this presentation, family is the most important part of my life. In the Lakota culture, we plan for seven generations. That means our children's children's children. I feel a great amount of responsibility personally being an educated Lakota woman to represent my ancestors, my tribe, and set an example for my children in both worlds, so to speak. I'm the first person in my family to gain a PhD. I did it for one reason, these five kids watching me. I want them to be comfortable in their own skin and proud of who they are and understand that they may not fit a stereotype of what native looks like, but that they have a responsibility to their ancestors and themselves to respect, represent respectfully. Next, please. And I hope you all find your own path to your dream job. With that, Wopila Tonka, many thanks. And the following slide, I will take questions or also have our um, contact information. Thank you. Thank you so much for a really fantastic uh, presentation. And I really appreciate uh, whenever we have a speaker that talks about the detours that they took um, along the way. Um, it's definitely uh, something that resonates with, with myself. I, I went into an engineering career before pivoting. Um, and so, and, and these days it is more common than ever for um, people starting out their career to expect to have some sort of shift, uh, whether that's brought on by their own personal decision or um, due to uh, the economy or recessions or pandemics that nobody was planning for. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that are that come in already. Um, and the first is, what is the best next step for students interested in getting involved in the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society? And are these um, options open to non-native students and I'll also add to that um, because we have about half and half high school students and college students so if there are different um, opportunities that are different for those two different audiences um, that'd be great to know right so um, you know you can become a member of the of the, the society an individual member um, we have lots of you know it's mainly kind of like Bush described at the beginning. It was formed, the society was for, formed to give tribes a place to kind of network and, and be able to raise things to a national level. So you can become a member and we have webinars and, um, you know, we try to do different interactive things. And some things are, are more specific just for the members. Um, a lot of our, you know, we do have Indian preference for uh, 
some of our opportunities, but that doesn't mean that you know we're not we're not looking for volunteers to help uh, when we put on our youth programs or also attend our conferences or um, suggest ideas. So um, this year we're looking, you know, we're we're trying to we're, we're optimistic for an in-person event, um, but we also may be doing some hybrid things with uh, like our summer youth practicum. We're talking about possibly doing like a virtual partner. We, with having like a smaller group at our on-site and then having them have like a virtual partner that would participate virtually. So there are opportunities in that, you know, we have the the interns, those, um, they do have an Indian preference, which means that we, you know, they would be selected first, but uh, they close on Friday. So if you're interested, you know, everything can be found at our website, nafws.org. Or if you have questions, you can, you know, feel free to email me, which is, I think it's that's still showing, right? My email. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so, Julie, Excellent. this is Butch. Um, can you m mention to them regarding this question your education staff person and her contact information? Yes. Yeah, so, um, Ashley Carlisle is our education coordinator. She is phenomenal. She is Danae. She has her master's in uh, wildlife conservation leadership. Her email is a Carlisle C A. Actually, I could probably put that in the chat, huh? Would that mm -hmm. be easier? I'll put her email in the chat, or you can also find her on our website. Um, yes, and she, you know, she's always got. We're we're starting a mentorship program, which I didn't I didn't uh, talk about. That's one thing we're we're starting to. So we're constantly looking to add more to our education programming. Excellent. We got a question from Ryan Tant, and he asks, was your pivot stressful? I'm personally looking for a shift, but feel that I could not be financially stable during this time. Change is hard. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it is, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's for the better or not. I think the actual change is hard. Yes, I mean, I struggled a lot, especially with my first change, because I, I did like my job. Um, but just things were kind of changing and I had shared an office with my sister and we had done all this work together and she was leaving. And then I had, I had this new degree and I felt like I should be doing something more with it. And, and, uh, but yeah, my dad, my dad panicked. Why would you leave? Well, I'm going to try something different, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's stressful as far as, uh, you know, you have to assess your own, um, financial situation, of course. Um, Sometimes I, I know a lot of times, you know, you stay somewhere because because of the money. But I've I've told my kids time and time again, I've I was much happier at a twelve dollar an hour job than I was at a fifty dollar an hour job sometimes. So, um, you know, you just have to decide what really is important to you. But, yeah, it's it's stressful. And hopefully I have a I have a great support system. I have a huge family. And even if dad was a little bit panicked, I think he had faith in me that I. I would make the right decision for myself and 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 each one gets a little bit easier and for me personally i feel like I've, i feel like there's always some like little signs that started telling me like this is this is not for you this is not for you and it's kind of interesting because when i was working in healthcare, um my boss would say well what would you do if money was no object and i would say i would work in wildlife i would be a wildlife biologist again so, uh, yeah, I think sometimes the universe hears you <laughs> and sometimes you get pushed. Um, and but, yeah, it's stressful. But, uh, you know, your support system and, and just kind of I'm a big pros and cons person. I'm always got my list. So, uh, yeah. What would you say um, was the most challenging part of your career path? Um, and this question also included balancing family and work. So if you could touch on that a bit as well. Yeah, um, that's something that I had to, I, I'll, first of all, I'll start with the first, the most challenging. Was that the first question? Yeah. Um, I think probably it's knowing when to leave is pretty challenging. Um, it's, you know, you kind of get stuck and you feel like, well, you know, should I, should I go now? Should I not go? What am I going to do? Um, you know, that's pretty challenging. I will tell you when I made the transition from working for the tribe to working for the college, um, I had been used to asking for permission for everything. Like the tribe had, has a really, uh, has a really, you know, process or as, as far as approval process. So I had been used to that. And 
uh, when I started working for the college, I, you know, I was a boss now and, and I had a staff and I, my, my boss was 180 miles away from me. We didn't have quite as this type of technology then. So at first I was like calling all the time, you know, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? And I had a great boss. She was, um, she was a, a presentation sister. She was, had her PhD and she called me one time and she said, Julie, just ask yourself when you, every decision you make, ask yourself, does this serve our mission? Is this in the best interest of the students? And then ask yourself if you can defend yourself in a court of law. If you can say yes to both of those, you'll be fine. So that was probably the best advice I did. Um, balancing family, I will tell you, um, you know, especially when I was working on my, I, I'm, I'm really fortunate. I have a very supportive husband. I, I, I just, I had always wanted to get my master's and the opportunity came up and it wasn't really the best time in my life, you know, but um, I just like, okay, I'm going to do it. And we just, we had the one, my one little girl at home at the time. So he was great. I know he helped. I, and we didn't have the online capability then. So it was more of like, we would go to um, go somewhere for a week and do a class or, or you know, do things like that. So he was really supportive. And um, then when I worked on my doctorate, I was, I had, you know, I had my baby at home and, and I was also teaching and working and people were like, oh, how do you do it? How do you do it? And honestly, what I told people is I do everything just well, like, okay, I'm just skating by here. Nothing is great. Like, I can't even read my dissertation because I see all the things I could have done differently. And, and you know, I, I also, I think back and, and there, there are some times when I, I feel like I could have been more present. And that was the advice that I got from one of my mentors was, you know, wherever you are, be present. Because at first, when I started working on my doctorate, I was the mom in the stands watching the ball game researching like reading and highlighting i was that mom and um my one mentor was like you know wherever you are be there be there mentally physically spiritually and so sometimes you just have to let things wait and and find different time for that and and prioritize and and i think i think i i think i've done uh, gotten better at that as i get older um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's a balancing act and, and honestly, I can, I don't know if I could have done it alone. I probably couldn't have done it alone. I have a very supportive family and I had, I had a few breakdowns in there too. <laughs> you know, my mom one time says, I would really like to help you, but I don't understand your research. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, anyway. Well, thank you so much. We do have to hop over to the next session. Um, if you are able to stay and you want to hang out in one of the lounges, that would be okay. Uh, Great. We don't have one specifically for this session, so I'll just recommend the one that's at the top, which is environmental justice. If you'd like to continue talking, you can hop over there, but I do have to close this and uh, open up the next session. So I just want to thank you, though, for your time today, um, for bringing your expertise and your voice to this conference, and for kicking us off with inspiration and reality, um, and we just really appreciate uh, you uh, coming today. So thank you again. Thank you for having me.